By the end of July 1940, the German Navy had almost completely ruled out any prospect of an invasion of Britain. The German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, never took part in any invasion planning anyway. Instead, it threw everything into bombing Britain, hoping to get the British to surrender before an invasion could get underway. So why on earth do the British still so steadfastly believe that only the Royal Air Force saved them from a German invasion in the summer of 1940? Hello, good to see you at the History Cafe. This is where we come to talk usually about historical stories everyone knows. Just want to try out some new ideas. I'm John Rosebank. And I'm Penelope Middlebow. At the History Cafe, we revisit stories that have got stuck in our collective memory, but just don't look quite right to us. So get yourself a coffee, pull up a chair, and let's see what happens. Early in 1940, as the Nazi armies drove mercilessly west across Europe, the British were understandably gripped by fear of invasion. Up and down the country, road signs, village, street and railway signs were ripped up and possible landing fields cut with trenches. Newly formed invasion committees solemnly listed wheelbarrows, hot water bottles and anything else they imagined might come in handy to fight the invader. Fireworks were handed in and kites put away in the loft private armies began to appear. When, in early May 1940, some MPs had called for everyone to be given guns, the government hurriedly created the Local Defence Volunteers, or LDVs. Quickly the joke was that it meant look, duck, vanish, or last desperate venture. Once he was Prime Minister, Churchill renamed the LDV the Home Guard. Within a week of their launch, a quarter of a million Home Guardsmen had lined up in church halls, practising with broomsticks because no guns were yet available. 70,000 rifles were quickly found for them, along with 20,000 firearms handed in by the public, uh, to which were added, among others, some rifles from the 1850s Indian Mutiny, discovered inexplicably in Manchester Zoo, and four dozen rusty First World War Lee Enfields from the props department of a West End theatre. Uh, in early June 1940, those lucky enough to have rifles were even issued with three or four cartridges each. The six foot four General Sir Edmund Tiny Ironside, the new Chief of Home Defence, reassuringly told his men that these cartridges could kill a leopard at 200 yards. A leopard. Mm -hmm. A leopard. The hit British sitcom Dad's Army has turned the Home Guard into a popular image of British bumbling stoicism in the face of the invader. Historian David Clark has shown that the reality was in fact younger and eventually much more efficiently armed and trained. But after all the laughs, Dad's army perpetuated for another generation of Brits the absolute conviction that the fictional Captain Mannering and his hilarious crew were facing the real threat of a German invasion. Women weren't allowed to join the Home Guard until 1943, but they formed their own illegal bands, including one in Surrey that called itself the Amazon Defence Corps. Illustrated newspapers patronisingly pictured them scanning the skies with their opera glasses and laying out gardening implements in their potting sheds, determined to take out German with them. The government distributed a leaflet to the people along the south coast. It has the same tone of unreality as the May 1980 handout Protect and Survive, which tells citizens to brush any nuclear fallout off their clothes before entering a building. In 1940, the pamphlet... If the invader comes, what to do and how to do it, advised, quotes, always carry pepper to throw in their eyes. Oh, and a sharp knife to kill them if necessary. More strategically, long stretches of coastline in the south and east were closed to the public and covered with barbed wire and anti-tank obstacles. At Margate, German tanks would have to negotiate around bathing machines filled with sand. Jagged iron barriers began appearing along country roads, many of them hiding to this day in fields and hedgerows. 18,000 concrete gun emplacements, nowadays often known as pillboxes, guarded important junctions. They were camouflaged with paint, or chicken feathers, or cow manure, or straw, or disguised as a sheep trough, or in one case as an ancient ruin complete with fake inscriptions. On seafronts, some masqueraded as public lavatories, bookstalls, cafes... 
writer Peter Fleming remembers the British mood in May and June 1940. It was, he writes, as though the whole country had been invited to a fancy dress ball and everybody was asking everybody else, what are you going as? Winston Churchill had been stirring up fears of invasion even before he became Prime Minister on the 10th of May 1940. Less than a month later, on 4th of June, he stood in the Commons and delivered his immortal We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. One Labour MP said the speech was worth a thousand guns. Others wept. And what nobody usually tells you, however, is that in private, after the early days of July 1940, Churchill hardly ever seems to have taken the threat of invasion seriously. In May 1940, as France fell, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill seemed as convinced as anybody else that Britain would be next. One of his first moves as Prime Minister had been to ship in six battalions home from India. Home defence was noticeably beefed up, new phones installed and plans made to blow up strategic bridges and harbours. Historian Andrew Roberts tells us how on the 12th of May, Churchill was flying back from a desperate meeting with the French government, which had already quit Paris and was holed up in Briere, 80 miles to the south. His military assistant, General Pug Ismay, turned to him in the plain and Pug naciously told him, we'll win the Battle of Britain. Churchill looked back and replied, you and I will be dead in three months. When he got back, Churchill went to Buckingham Palace for his regular meeting with the king. The invasion of this country comes next, he told him. Churchill urgently called for a top-secret briefing from his chiefs of staff, and they presented it on the 25th of May. They predicted a German onslaught. Quotes, unrestricted air attack aimed at breaking public morale, starvation of the country by attacks on shipping and ports, and occupation by invasion. It's all the more surprising, therefore, to discover that in private... At least after the early days of July 1940, Churchill hardly ever seems to have taken the threat of invasion seriously. Now we can compare Churchill's dinner party conversation that summer with his public speeches. It's all in Martin Gilbert's authorised and extensively researched biography. 12th of July, for example, was a Friday, the third day of what is now regarded as the Battle of Britain. But over supper at the Prime Minister's country house, Chequers, Churchill told his weekend guests that, quote, he personally doubted that invasion would take place. Nonetheless, he told them, he intended in his next radio broadcast on the BBC, quote, to give the impression of long and dangerous vigils. Well, on Sunday lunch, he again assured his guests that invasion was highly unlikely. But that evening, he went on the BBC and he intoned, we await undismayed by the impending assault. Perhaps it will come tonight. Gentlemen listening in their London clubs burst into applause. A couple of days later, Churchill was telling the Commons, we may be sure that there is a plan built up over several years for destroying Britain. And yet in private, he was saying that Hitler would have been taken completely by surprise when France fell so quickly, with the result that any plans he might have made to invade England would now be useless. A month later, on the 15th of August 1940, the German air force, the Luftwaffe, launched the most bloodily destructive attack so far. And yet, on the 22nd of August, a few days later, Churchill loaded 154 British tanks onto ships heading away from Britain for the Middle East. They included half of what was left of the tanks called Matildas, which had arguably been the most effective tanks in France earlier in the year. And with them went three regiments of men, 48 anti-tank guns, 48 field guns and 20 anti-aircraft guns. They were being sent to face the Italians who'd just joined the war and were threatening British control of the eastern Mediterranean. If Churchill thought, as he publicly claimed, that Britain was facing, quotes, the end of Christian civilization, sending a large detachment of his finest troops to the other end of the Mediterranean, armed with much of his best remaining weaponry, would seem rather brash. Churchill clearly knew, or he'd worked out, far more about what the Germans were up to than he publicly admitted either at the time or later in his memoirs. 
See, everything had changed on the 22nd of May 1940, 12 days after Churchill had taken over at number 10. The French were still retreating hopelessly in front of the German tanks. But that day, the codebreakers at the government listening station at Bletchley Park had begun to be able to crack the Luftwaffe secret codes regularly and rapidly. At first, they selected anything that looked important and sent it to the new Prime Minister. But he was soon demanding to have every scrap sent him unsifted in a locked, buff-coloured box, to which he had the only other key. And he shared the information with very few. Other intelligence that was arriving on Churchill's desk early in July 1940, just as the so-called Battle of Britain was getting going, showed that the Luftwaffe had only half as many bombers as the British had previously thought. Even more significant than intelligence on the German Air Force, however, was Churchill's understanding of the situation at sea. For Churchill, this was the heart of it. He'd been First Lord of the Admiralty both at the start of the First World War and at the beginning of the Second. On the 10th of July 1940, the day the Battle of Britain is now thought to have begun, he wrote a long paper on the invasion and he showed it to the new First Lord of the Admiralty, Albert A. V. Hillsborough. On the 18th of July, Churchill presented this report to the War Cabinet. Quotes, what would happen if the enemy escorted an invasion with heavy warships? The answer is that as far as we know at present, they have no heavy ships, which are not under long repair, except those at Trondheim, a port they'd captured in Norway, which are closely watched by our very largely superior forces. Churchill knew that by contrast there were more than a thousand armed Royal Naval vessels waiting in home waters to take the Germans on. The fact was that the Royal Navy could fend off anything the Germans were able to send just with the cruisers sitting in the Thames and the Humber. The Germans had not been able to get any significant ships through the Channel for months. It would, Churchill concluded, be, quote, a most hazardous and even suicidal operation to commit a large army to the accidents of the sea in the teeth of our very numerous armed patrolling forces. Well, it was obvious to anyone who understood the balance of naval forces that a German invasion was completely impossible. At the end of July, after the Luftwaffe had attacked and sunk several of his warships in harbour at Portland and Portsmouth, the commander of the home fleet, Admiral Forbes, told Churchill that he would no longer risk his heavy ships in the narrow channel. Well, Churchill just laughed in his face. He never took, he said, any notice of what the Royal Navy said it would and wouldn't do. He had, he said, quotes, not a shadow of doubt that if the Germans invaded the south coast of Britain, we would see every available battleship storming through the Straits of Dover. That's exactly what Admiral Raider in charge of the German Navy and the other German admirals also believed, and why they were telling their German army counterparts that an invasion was utterly out of the question. The point is central to our understanding of the summer of 1940. Churchill quickly worked out, exactly as the German admirals had, that the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, just couldn't take on the British Royal Navy, and that the Luftwaffe was completely unable to make up the difference. Historian Andrew Roberts expresses surprise that, quotes, Churchill should have clung for so long to the belief that modern warships were almost invulnerable from the air. Actually, as we've seen, what's really surprising is that so few people realise that Churchill was right. Anyway, it's really no wonder if at his private Chequers dinner parties from the middle of July 1940, exactly the moment we nowadays call the start of the Battle of Britain, Churchill was drinking his champagne and laughing off talk of an invasion. He was, Martin Gilbert records, quotes, more cheerful than any time since he took office. So why did Churchill continue to march into the House of Commons and onto BBC Radio and tell a frightened nation that the Germans were coming any day? Why did Churchill go on saying publicly that a German invasion was on its way when he privately didn't believe it? It seems there were a number of reasons. Over supper at Chequers on the 12th of July 1940, a couple of days into the Battle of Britain, Churchill told Generals Auchinleck and Paget that, quote, the Great Invasion Scare is serving a most useful purpose. It is well on the way to providing us with the finest defensive army we've ever possessed, and it's keeping every man and woman tuned to a high pitch of readiness. Churchill certainly claimed to believe that, galvanised by the threat of Nazi invaders, 
the British army would be ready by the autumn of 1914 not just to defend Britain, but more importantly, to go on the offensive. In fact, behind closed doors, smoking his ten Cuban cigars each day, he could hardly stop talking about where he would attack once the army was up to scratch. On the 2nd of July 1940, he'd asked for a study on whether the German-occupied Channel Islands could be retaken by commandos. Over dinner on the 9th of August, he wanted to discuss an autumn invasion through the Netherlands into the German industrial area along the Ruhr Valley. That was besides other attacks he had in mind on the French Cherbourg Peninsula and targets in Italy. On 19th of July 1940, Churchill appointed a new commander of home forces, responsible for the defence against invasion. He replaced the towering Ironside with the smaller but tougher Allen Colonel Shrapnel Brook, fresh from the disastrous British Army campaign in France. Churchill instructed Brook to pull most of his troops back from the coasts, leaving only a thin line of defence, often little more than the poorly equipped Home Guard. Brook often complained bitterly in private that Churchill was nothing but an amateur war gamer and he should leave strategy and tactics to the professionals. But actually, Brooke agreed with the Prime Minister that the regular soldiers needed to withdraw from the coast. Brooke thought they needed to be more mobile. They should be nimble, able to meet the invasion wherever it fell. Churchill cheerfully puffed back that if need be, Brooke could commandeer the tourist buses from Brighton to move his troops around. But Churchill wasn't being entirely straightforward with his new commander of home forces. In fact, he never seems to have shared with Brooke his belief that an invasion was unlikely. Churchill didn't want a mobile army. He wanted to withdraw his men from the coast because he wanted them back in base, back in camp, getting into training, getting prepared for attacks in the autumn or the following spring. Brooke now often found himself among Churchill's dinner party guests. He was perplexed by the Prime Minister's constant talk of attack. He recorded in his diary, which he wrote for his wife, even though it was against army regulations, what a strain it was to have dinner with the Prime Minister at the end of a long day. Quotes, he's full of offensive thoughts for the future. Brooke believed he was desperately short of troops to fight off an invasion. Didn't want to talk about attack. All he had was 29 below-strength divisions, with others sailing off for Egypt, taking many of his best tanks with them, at high cost, he fumed, to the security of the United Kingdom base. Day after day, Brooke recorded in his diary his surprise that the Germans hadn't yet arrived. The task was to prevent an invasion. What on earth was the Prime Minister on about? Launching attacks. But keen to get his army fighting fit, Churchill seems actively to have encouraged the man he'd put in charge of home defence to believe that the Germans really were poised to pounce. Actually, besides provoking Brooke and getting the British army into shape, Churchill had other important things on his mind. Churchill seems privately to have been pretty sure the Germans were not about to invade in the summer of 1940. But publicly, he went on announcing that he expected an invasion at any moment. Well, partly, it seems to be an ploy to lick the British army into shape, but there was a much more important reason than that. Historian Martin Gilbert writes that Churchill's ultimate aim in these weeks was to secure American backing against the Germans. Just as in the opening years of the First World War, the Americans had been staying carefully neutral, there was profit to be made from both sides. As we shall see another time at History Cafe, the Americans had plenty of investments in Nazi Germany. But Churchill could see that Britain had neither the manpower nor the resources to defeat the Nazis on her own. They needed American support. The gloomy Chief of Staff report back on 25th of May 1940, which predicted bombing, attacks on shipping and invasion, concluded that the British had to get American help, quotes, without which we do not think we could continue this war with any chance of success. The British at least needed American cash and weapons. Ideally, Churchill, who remember himself had an American mother, aimed to bring the Americans into the war on the British side. Ever since his first days as Prime Minister, Churchill had been talking on the telephone and by telegram to the American President, Franklin D. Roosevelt. He pleaded for economic and military help. Sometimes he signed his cables KBO, which stood for Keep Buggering On. But privately, 
Churchill was exasperated by the attitude of what he called those bloody Yankees. However sympathetic FDR might have been as an individual, he was in a tricky position. 1940 was election year and he hoped to be the first man to be allowed to stand for president for a third term. But there was hardly a soul in the States who wanted to get involved in Europe's war. An opinion poll showed only 7% in favour. Well, with the scale of American investments in Germany, not surprising. FDR was also reading pessimistic reports from the US ambassador in London. Once the Luftwaffe raids began, one ambassador, Joe Kennedy, father of the future president, reported that the RAF was almost, quote, out of commission, and that British surrender, quote, would be inevitable. Kennedy strongly recommended the Americans keep out of it. On the 27th of May, FDR telegrammed Churchill suggesting that if, when, the Germans invaded and occupied Britain, the Royal Navy should sail out of harm's way to Canada. The British King should take up residence in Bermuda. Canada was a bit too close for American anti-royal sensibilities. Churchill looked up from telegram, called for a weak whiskey and soda, and decided not to reply. Churchill knew he had to win the Americans over. On the 21st of June, he asked his chief military assistant, Pug Ismay, for a list of all the military supplies the Americans had so far sent. Ismay's reply was nil. Churchill had spent plenty of time in the States and was convinced that persuasion, propaganda, would have no effect. What was needed was some kind of military breakthrough, a success to prove men like Joe Kennedy, the ambassador, wrong. Americans wanted to be on the winning side. That was in fact the real reason for launching the attack on the French fleet at Mercer Kabir at the end of June. We talked about it last time at the History Café. The British chiefs of staff had certainly been anxious about what would happen if French ships fell into German hands, but they'd have been willing to see them disabled and disarmed, which the Germans had agreed to do. And in fact, so had the French, although as historian Andrew Roberts points out, a mix-up over intercepted messages meant that the British didn't find that out until too late. More important for us here, Churchill pushed through the decision to attack and sink the French fleet. On 28th of June, he asked into Admiralty for their views on attacking if the French refused to cooperate. The answer had come back significantly that the effect on American opinion would be good. Well, the Americans had in fact been anxiously and urgently putting pressure on the French to make absolutely sure their ships didn't fall into German hands. Recent research in American archives shows that Churchill consulted President Roosevelt about the attack and got his approval before it was launched. Churchill's assistant, Private Secretary Jock Colville, later remembered that Churchill was, quote, convinced that the Americans were impressed by ruthlessness. The American reaction to our attack on the French fleet was of the first importance. So the real reason why, on the 3rd of July, the British sank the French fleet at Merzokobir was to help get the Americans on side against Hitler. Shocking stuff. Mm. Shocking. It was for the same reason that Churchill maintained the fiction that a German invasion was bound to come. He began to develop a dystopian narrative about what would happen if Britain were invaded and conquered. The suggestion was that it would be the Americans' turn next. Churchill needed some kind of military success to win the reluctant Americans over. He also needed to convince the Americans that if Britain fell, they'd be next. His continued insistence that a German invasion was imminent, held back only by British victories in the air, was the perfect combination. On the 18th of June, Churchill had intoned on BBC Radio, quote, if we fail, the whole world, including the United States, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. On 17th of July, he had lunch with Edgar Maurer, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist from the Chicago Daily News. I myself shall never make peace with the Germans, he said. That's not at all what I am here for. But if the Germans succeeded in taking Britain and some puppet ruler were to hand over the Royal Navy to German control, the United States Navy would then face the combined force of German, Italian and British fleets and what was left of the French, massed, said Churchill, in one armada. Churchill left the journalist in no doubt. Make no mistake... If he got us down, he would go for you at once. Of course, it was absolute nonsense and Churchill knew it, but it was an image he would keep coming back to. By the time Churchill met Myra, 
some American weapons had begun to arrive, 200,000 old First World War rifles. Most were given to the Home Guard so that they could hand their more modern British Army issue weapons back to the regulars and put their broomsticks back under the stairs. On the 30th of July 1940, Churchill fired off a telegram to FDR, urgently demanding much more. Ten days later, as Luftwaffe attacks over the Channel escalated, the Americans finally agreed. If the British sent over skeleton crews, they could pick up 50 antique mothballed American destroyers from the last war. Churchill quickly dispatched another telegram, thanking the president, but adding, we have a million men waiting for rifles. But what Churchill really believed was that American public opinion needed a victory before they'd send any more help. And besides sinking a handful of French ships, Britain wasn't making any military advances. The iron vigil of the Royal Navy around Britain's coast was effective, but it didn't create exciting headlines. Broadcasting the threat of invasion and the extraordinary feats of the RAF under Luftwaffe attack turned the British pilots into heroic last-ditch defenders fighting valiantly to turn the tide against overwhelming odds, a fight for British survival. It was the closest thing to a victory Churchill could come up with. Andrew Roberts paints a scene of General de Gaulle by now in exile in Britain, staying at Chequers, the Prime Minister's country house, in August 1940. The Frenchman found Churchill in the garden, shaking his fists at the sky. So they won't come. De Gaulle was amazed. Why should Churchill want the Germans to bomb British cities? Churchill shot back. The bombing of Oxford, Coventry, Canterbury will cause such a wave of indignation in the United States that they'll come into the war. By this stage in the summer of 1940, the need for American assistance was desperate. It wasn't just a question of America's capacity to produce weapons. It was a matter of cash. Britain was close to running out of dollars and gold, and the Americans were refusing to extend any more credit to the British, let alone offer to give them anything, to fight the scourge of Nazism. Churchill told his cabinet they would go on placing orders with the Americans in the belief that, once the presidential election were over in November 1940, they would wake up to the catastrophe playing out in the rest of the world. There was even a scheme to requisition British wedding rings and jewellery. It would only have raised 20 million, but it might shame the Americans into offering some help. Churchill's famous Battle of Britain speech on the 20th of August, perhaps the most famous speech he ever made, never was so much owed by so many to so few, was aimed just as much at the Americans as at the British. After his famous words, Churchill went on, These two great organisations of the English-speaking democracies, the British Empire and the United States, will have to be somewhat mixed up together in some of their affairs for mutual and general advantage. I could not stop it if I wished. No one can stop it. Like the Mississippi, it just keeps rolling along. By this time, Church was afraid there'd be a run on Sterling and that the British financial position would become desperate. The American response was to suspect that the Brits were exaggerating their poverty just to beg more credit. In reality, the British were having to take out a $300 million loan from the Belgian government in exile. Having lost their entire country, the Belgians were willing to draw cash from their African assets just to keep Britain afloat. The distinguished British economist John Maynard Keynes threw up his hands and called the American attitude a straightforward case of beggar my neighbour. One cabinet minister complained that the American government, quotes, is asking for the moon and appears unwilling to pay sixpence. The British were reduced to offering long leases on American bases in Newfoundland, Bermuda and other British holdings across the Americas just in order to get their hands on 50 old destroyers from the United States. But Churchill was willing to sign off on the deal. It was not so much that they needed the battleships, he explained, but to get the Americans to abandon their neutrality. Selling destroyers to Britain, he hoped, quote, the United States would have made a long step towards coming into the war on our side. So Churchill went on making urgent broadcasts about the threat of invasion, delayed only by the heroic and successful resistance of the RAF, even though he privately didn't believe a word of it. It was a message not only the British, but also the Americans needed to hear. At Chequers on the 30th of August 1940, he was drinking champagne from 1911, the year he'd originally become First Lord of the Admiralty. Yet again, he told his guests that an invasion was highly unlikely. He was still bubbling with excitement about going on the offensive in 1941 and 1942. On the 2nd of September 1940, he declared to the War Cabinet 
that invasion was unlikely to materialise. But three days later he stood up in the Commons and announced that, quote, no one must suppose that the danger of invasion has passed. So was Churchill right about there being no chance for German invasion? He had a well-earned reputation for jumping to hasty conclusions and coming up with wild strategic plans. Roosevelt once said, Winston has a hundred ideas a day, of which at least four are good. But everything we've seen on the German side suggests Churchill's analysis was correct, and informed opinion in Britain also agreed. On the 4th of September 1940, the British Chiefs of Staff finally delivered their own considered report. They'd been working on it for some time, and their considered judgment had clearly moved a long way since their first depressing assessment back in May. Making no mention at all of the bitter air war going on above their heads, they now stated plainly that invasion would be, quote, an immensely formidable undertaking and is becoming increasingly so every day. It was so risky, said the joint heads of all the British armed services, that, quote, it's probable that Germany would not attempt such a gamble in the immediate future unless she felt that no other course would offer her results in time. It was carefully worded, but Britain's top military minds broadly agreed with Churchill's private view. A German invasion was very unlikely to happen. But already Churchill's oratory had given birth to a great British myth that the courage of the RAF was all that lay between British freedom and German invasion. The amazing thing, however, is that the Germans may have been playing exactly the same game, as we shall see next time at the History Café. For more on this story and others at our History Café, go to historycafé.org. There you'll find information about us and also about further reading you can do. It's also a way to ask us any questions you might have.